Good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Fold. I'm director of Hollywood Health and Society, which is a program of the USC Annenberg Norman Lear Center. At the Lear Center, we know that stories matter, entertainment matters, and the facts matter. The past year has demonstrated how important accuracy is with regard to health and medicine. For 20 years, we have been helping TV and screenwriters get the facts they need to make their stories accurate and impactful. For those of you who don't know us, Hollywood Health and Society serves as a free resource for the entertainment content creators, connecting them with information, experts, and real people with lived experiences on all topics of health, safety, and security. Call or email us with questions for your scripts and projects. We're here to help. And as always, it's free. So last week was the 46th anniversary of Roe v. Wade. It was on January 22nd. Now, in September, we had the 20th anniversary of medication abortion. I bet some of you have not known that medication abortion has been around for 20 years. So that's something we wanna talk about tonight. And then you may have heard that recently the Supreme Court ruled to reinstate an FDA policy that required people to go to a clinic in person to obtain medication abortion care during a pandemic. So we thought it was a good time to revisit the issue of abortion, given all of these things I've just listed, and why it's still so difficult to get the subject covered on TV and covered accurately for that matter. So before we start, I'd like to show you a, a quick video that uh, takes a look at some shows over the years that have dealt with abortion. Let's take a look. What's with Crystal? A pill that'll abort a pregnancy up to 49 days. And the FDA is approving it? Yes. I'm thinking it's a terrific medical advancement for women. I have decided to terminate. You still not gonna tell Jay Papa? I really don't see what the telling him would do for him, or me for that matter. And since this is my body, it's my choice. Mom, I'll get us since you just had an abortion. You're a good son, Brendan. Tonight's moderator is a novelist and screenwriter who's written for Orange is the New Black and the forthcoming Netflix show, Social Distance. She's also the former executive director of the Texas Equal Access Fund, a nonprofit abortion fund based in Dallas. Please welcome Merit Tierce. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Kate. And um, thanks so much to Hollywood Health and Society for putting this together and for all the work that you do. You're just uh, really a fantastic organization. And um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I just want to note that social distance is not no longer forthcoming. It did come out uh, in October on Netflix. Um, and so I want to introduce uh, our first panelist tonight. Our first guest is Dr. Colleen McNicholas. Uh, she is an abortion provider and the chief medical officer of Planned Parenthood St. Louis. Uh, and I, uh, so we're going to start with um, a provider's uh, just view of the landscape of abortion in America, what it's like right now. And then um, specifically, Dr. McNicholas, if you could talk to us about uh, medication abortion 
And I think just so we're all on the same page, if you could briefly explain how medication and abortion usually work, um, and then how uh, the provision of medication abortion varies maybe from state to state, I think that would be helpful. And then uh, how the landscape has changed during COVID and maybe with respect to the SCOTUS ruling from last week. Uh, I know that's a lot, but <laughs> uh, thank you and welcome. All right. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Merritt and Kate for getting this together. Um, as you noted, yeah. uh, my task to deliver all of this information okay. in five to 10 minutes is, is a hefty one, but I will do my best uh, to boil it down to what I think are the important points. So um, I thought I'd start with just a sort of brief overview of um, what, as you said, what actually is medication abortion, because I do think that there is still a lot of misconception about what it is and what it isn't. Um, as folks probably know, um, there are two ways to achieve abortion or pregnancy termination. The first is by a procedural or aspiration. And we're not gonna talk much about that today. We're gonna talk more about the second approach, which is medication or what I think the community more, more um, commonly refers to as the pill abortion. And medication abortion, um, just sort of at the very basic level, um, involves two medications. The first is called mifepristone. Um, and I heard it referenced in the, the video that we started with. Um, that medication is the, is the medication I usually tell people is the one that stops the pregnancy from growing. And the second medication is called mesoprostol. That's the medication that generally helps to pass the pregnancy. And although that's the most common regimen we use in the United States, there certainly are places across the globe where mesoprostol alone or that second medication can be used to effectively end a pregnancy. But for the purpose of this, um, this talk, we're gonna talk, when I say medication abortion, I am referring to the, the combination of those two medications. The other thing I think that's really important to remember is that logistically, the experience of medication abortion is nearly identical to having a miscarriage. And so the reality is that miscarriage is quite common. Um, and so many people have that experience as a reference. Um, and I think that sort of is one of the reasons that we'll talk about why the rates of medication abortion are dramatically increasing over the last couple of years. One really important point for you all um, and not that any of you are offenders of this, but certainly there have been from time to time, um, times in the media, in entertainment venues where medication abortion has been confused with emergency contraception. And so I just wanna really reiterate that um, what we normally or, or colloquially refer to as plan B or the morning after pill is not medication abortion. Emergency contraception, prevents pregnancy where medication abortion interrupts or terminates an already established pregnancy. So that's just an important point, I think, to sort of reemphasize um, as we are, we're talking about medication abortion. So Kate um, referred to this already in her opening, but medication abortion has been around for a really long time. We have lots of data about how safe and efficacious it is, um, and lots of data actually to support um, how well it's liked by patients who choose that method. Just to give you sort of a, a broad landscape view, in 2000, around 2000, 2001, the percentage of abortions that were completed with medication was about 5%. In 2014, that number was 29%. In 2017, that number was nearly 40%. And I can tell you just anecdotally in my own experience at the health centers that we run that offer abortion services, we are seeing upwards of almost 60% of patients who are seeking abortion with us choosing medication abortion. And so the numbers are rising substantially. And, and the reason for that um, can be pretty varied. You know, everybody's abortion experience and why they choose a particular route is um, different and reflective of and informed by um, the many different intersecting realities of their life. But some of the things that I hear pretty frequently are, well, it's super safe. It, in, it avoids anything invasive. So think pelvic exams, for example. You can safely end your pregnancy without any physician or clinician coming near 
your vagina, which is really a, a bonus for lots of people and a priority. Um, many people, as we talked about, are already familiar with miscarriage. And so the being able to understand a process you already went through in the context of abortion is, is oftentimes very comforting for folks. They can choose who they share that experience with and they can control the timing as opposed to when they have to come into the clinic for an aspiration or procedural abortion. And then, you know, we'll hear a little bit later from, um, from somebody who has chosen to use medication abortion. Um, but there's the new kid on the block, which is the pandemic, right? So abortion patients are looking to limit their contact with health centers to really minimize their potential exposure in both acquiring and by um, spreading the COVID um, uh, disease. And so, you know, the pandemic is another great example of um, why folks might want to choose medication abortion. You know, there's really no medical reason why most folks who choose medication abortion can't achieve that via a telehealth appointment. Um, and I will say that, you know, the healthcare system broadly has learned a lot about how people want to access their healthcare during this pandemic. People like having their cardiology appointment from their couch. Um, they like not having to run in the 45 minutes they have for a lunch break to the doctor's office or to the pharmacy. Um, and abortion patients are no different. I think they, we have seen over um, this last year, and God, that's kind of crazy to say that the pandemic has been happening for a year, but we have seen over the last year that abortion patients also want their healthcare delivered in this way. Um, you heard a little bit earlier about um, some of the, the work that's been happening um, with the ACLU and then has recently been stymied by a Supreme Court decision. The reality is that it doesn't really matter in many places how a patient wants to access their abortion care. What drives the reality of that experience for most of them is what their local and state laws and restrictions and regulations are. And so I have the opportunity of providing care in an incredibly restrictive state in Missouri, as well as in a more um, progressive state like Illinois. And so I'm going to use the example of the recent um, decision out of the Supreme Court to demonstrate what I think is the tragic reality of the difference in access to abortion depending on where you live. So the ACLU, along with ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, during the pandemic uh, filed suit against the FDA. The FDA is one of the many ways in which patients have uh, exist or in which patients um, experience barriers to accessing the abortion experience that they want. And what they asked was during this pandemic, would it be possible for, um, for clinicians and physicians to be able to provide medication and abortion in a way that was most consistent with the public health um, goals during a pandemic? And so essentially what they were asking for is, is could physicians mail medication abortion to patients? And for a short time, we were able to do that. And I have to tell you, patients really enjoyed the experience. Um, they really appreciated the opportunity, again, to be able to avoid coming to the clinic. Um, in many places, of course, there are not a ton of places where you can actually access abortion care. And so for many, it eliminated long drives and um, sort of logistic barriers. Um, but that all changed when the Supreme Court then handed down a decision um, which essentially invalidated the injunction that allowed us to do that. And so, um, and so for us, what that meant was we had to get on the phone and call all of the patients who were scheduled for care in that way, and then reassess whether and how they were going to be able to then come into the clinic to get those medications. Um, and for some of them, that then caused a substantial delay in getting their care. So this is one. And I think example. that there's a limit on how late how late into an That's early right. pregnancy you can use medication abortion. Can you I, in the in that yeah. West Wing clip? I think I heard them say 49 days, but I know it's up to 10 weeks in some places, right? That's right. So since that time, we've had some new evidence and new data to say that it's safe up to we offer it till 11 weeks of pregnancy. So, okay. but you're right, if you were already on the cusp of that cutoff, then we now have eliminated an entire option of abortion for you and those folks would have to have an aspiration. 
So mm-hmm. all in all, what you know, what what I what I want you to hear is that there are so many barriers, both sort of on the the local level, on the state level, and then even on the federal level, um, in places like the in areas like the FDA, where we could be making some real dramatic improvements in how uh, patients are able to access abortion care. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, so just to remind the audience, the bios of the panelists are in the chat. And you can also, if you have a question that comes up uh, while anyone is speaking, you can go ahead and enter it in the Q&A. And um, we will take some questions at the end from everything that's come uh, into the chat. And we'll try to answer some things uh, if we can as we go. Um, so, uh, Doctor, I think, so I, I guess I'd like to just give you a um, uh, a chance to tell all the TV writers in the room. Uh, you've had so many experiences with so many different, um, I mean, all kinds of people have abortions for all kinds of reasons. And, uh, and that's your daily experience. And if you could give us some guidance as far as what you feel like is most important for us to try to represent on screen or most important to try to correct from what's been misrepresented, uh, we'd love to know that. Yeah, thanks for the question. So I will say um, it it doesn't make for good TV or drama, but abortion is pretty boring, right? Um, Actually, Mm -hmm. lots of people have abortion and for lots of them, for most of them, it's not a gut-wrenching decision. Um, It is just a reality. They find out they're pregnant. They know it's not the right thing for them. They figure out how they could have an abortion and they have the abortion. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, for many folks, it's not a super... Um, emotional experience to to navigate that process. So I think that's one important thing. Um, The other is that, you know, it's, it's super safe. um, And that is not necessarily um, a point I bring up because I think that entertainment is doing it wrong. I bring it up because I think that is one of the most common things that the anti-choice movement tries to make people believe, right? And so we are constantly fighting this narrative. Um, so I think it's common, it's safe, um, and for most people, it is not this huge emotional decision for them. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. Those are two really, really important points. And I think the first one you made is um, a really essential paradox of how we represent abortion on television, because in storytelling, we're always looking for the drama and you know what will make uh, something captivating and uh, so we have a problem with if we want to accurately represent abortion, uh, it's the most common abortion, as, as you mentioned, is, is pretty boring. Um, and so what we see in the media and in television is kind of a, a false representation that's more dramatic than the average experience, I think, emotionally. And, uh, and uh, I think that what uh, I'm sure Dr. Sisson will talk about uh, later too is that the 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 actual great drama around abortion is the access, uh, which we saw during is the, all of the obstacles that people encounter to access. And I think um, it's fun to talk about medication abortion, especially because you would think medication abortion is an even bigger challenge for this uh, because what could possibly be dramatic or exciting about taking a pill if you're trying to tell you know, a cool story on television. Um, But by the same token, uh, why should you have to to (laughs) encounter so many obstacles en route to taking a pill? Um, So there is a lot of story there if you you look for it. Um, And I think that's a good segue to our next guest, but I just also wanna say um, uh, uh, that I really, I won't put you on the spot, but I, um, you're reminding me that something that I want to remind all the TV writers in the audience is that there are a lot of people around the person who's seeking an abortion who have really cool stories to tell. I mean, I, I love the way you put that you have the opportunity of serving in Missouri. And uh, I've been interviewing abortion providers and clinic staff over the past year, and every one of them has a, a really amazing story about how they came to the work, and and then also just everything they encounter trying to do the work because it is so politicized and it's such a a, a circus in some ways in in the U.S. So uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. 
You bet. For your work. Will, you know, I will say this one, one additional thing, which is that although it might not seem really dramatic, I think one of the most important things we can do, not just in sort of the entertainment world, but is to normalize it. So if you're this particular series or this movie is not about abortion, but somebody in the story has an abortion, that's a really important um, piece for the abortion movement, just to sort of make it be mm -hmm. part of another kind of story. Absolutely, absolutely, that's a great point. Um, and uh, back to your point about the safety, I think that that, that is such a significant, uh, really tremendous misrepresentation just in the popular consciousness that abortion is dangerous and when actually pregnancy and childbirth are far more dangerous. Um, so, okay, so next, uh, thank you so much. Our next, uh, who's gonna share her story of uh, seeking a medication abortion during the pandemic. Um, welcome, thank you. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Merritt and Dr. McNicholas and Kate. Um, I am thrilled to be here. Um, I am an abortion storyteller. Um, I'm affiliated with an organization called We Testify um, that really works to elevate stories of um, people who have had abortions like me. Um, if any of the TV writers in the room are interested, um, We Testify is online there at wetestify.org if you are looking for an abortion storyteller. Um, so I actually really liked that you guys said that abortion stories are boring because I am about to tell a very boring story. Um, <laughs> so uh, get ready. Um, so I uh, learned I was pregnant in March of 2020. Um, so on, on March 6th, I did a job interview in the morning and in the evening I took a pregnancy test and found out that I was pregnant. Um, I was not expecting to be pregnant. I was not trying to be pregnant. I was just pregnant. Um, that day was a Friday. Uh, so I took the weekend with my husband to just sort of talk through what it meant. Um, and what it, what was happening around me at the time was that um, COVID-19 had come to my city and every single day we got a news briefing and they were like, it's only 10 cases. And then the next day they'd be like, it's 30 cases. And then the next day they were like, it's 70 cases. And then by the time that I called Planned Parenthood, there were up to 200 cases of COVID-19 in my city. Um, and there was also this ongoing debate about whether or not they should shut down the school, should public transit be shut down. Um, so there was just like a lot of panic and, and confusion happening at the time. Um, so through this, this process, my husband and I were just like, we cannot have a baby during the pandemic. Like, this is crazy. I was looking for a job. We both have student loans that we have to pay off. Like we can't pay for the upkeep of a child. Um, and of course, you know, there were lots of other reasons I didn't want to be pregnant. And, you know, the more, um, stories that I see about women giving birth alone in a hospital wearing a mask is was very um, scary to me. Um, so I called Planned Parenthood, um, I would say just about six days after I learned I was pregnant. Um, I made the appointment um, and I select I, I chose medication abortion because I was early enough in my pregnancy um, where I would be able to do that. That was an option for me. Um, and then I had to do something called informed consent. So in my state where I live, I have to do an informed consent with a physician um, that will essentially tell me all the risks of, of having an abortion. Um, thankfully, in my state, I was uh, able to do that via phone. Um, and you do have to do that 24 hours before you go to the clinic for your um, abortion appointment. So I did the informed consent. It was actually incredibly interesting because they kind of walk you through all of the risks of having an abortion. Um, but then they walk you through all the risks of being pregnant and giving birth. And, you know, they were like, this is giving birth is incredibly risky. Um, I remember something that they said, it just like stuck in my brain. Um, they said, abortion is no more dangerous than having a colonoscopy. Um, so that was very fascinating to me. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, that's, that's very interesting. Um, the day of my appointment came, it was a Saturday. Um, by this time, everything like the schools had been shut down. People were doing virtual learning. It was like very, 
it was like at that time where everybody was like washing their groceries and stuff like nobody really <laughs> knew the like the right the early pandemic days um there was the PPE shortage at the time. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, so the the day of my appointment came. Um, I normally get around using public transit. Um, I was not able. I chose not to take public transit that day, largely because of the of the pandemic. That I would just wasn't able to. Um, I had to go to the clinic in order to to take the pill. Right. So one thing um, in order to take the first dose of of the mifepristone that Dr. McNicholas was talking about. Um, I, my husband drove me to the clinic. We did decide that he was not going to come inside with me just because of people and their germs and bodies being around. Um, they do tell you in the, when you make the appointment that it does take about four hours. So you should plan on being there for a significant amount of time. Um, I got there, I checked in, I'm sitting in a room. No one is wearing a mask, not one person. Um, there was a movie playing in the waiting room and it was that movie, Guess Who, with Ashton Kutcher and Zoe Saldana and Bernie Mac. And I, I was like, I'm never going to see this movie and think about anything else. Um, so that, that happened. Um, I did have to go in and I did have to have an ultrasound um, in order for them to actually confirm my pregnancy. Um, I was pregnant, um, as I knew already. Um, I, they sent me back out into the waiting room. I think I waited for probably an hour and a half before I went in for counseling. Um, and they do two counseling sort of sessions um, during the time when you're in the waiting room. So the first counseling session, um, they kind of get sort of your demographics. Um, and then they sort of ask you a series of questions that are like, is somebody forcing you to have an abortion? Are you being coerced? Are you doing this of your own will? Do you already have children? Have you had an abortion before? Are you on any of these medications like steroids? Um, I went back out. I waited another hour. Then I did a second uh, counseling session. And then when I came back out, there was just one other person in the waiting room and there was nobody at the front desk. And I was like, what's happening here? So I just sat down. I was like, I, I don't really know what's, what's going on. Um, Somebody came out, this other person went in, she came out a couple minutes later, and then I heard nothing for I think 45 minutes. So at this point I'm freaking out. I was like, the clinic is closed. What am I gonna do if I can't have this now? I was like, I don't know if this clinic is gonna be shut down. Like I have no idea what is going to happen to me. So I'm like hyperventilating. I call my spouse on the phone. I'm like, I don't know what to do. They're not here. He's like, I'm going to call them. I was like, there's no one here. You can't like, there's nothing <laughs> happening. So finally somebody hears me crying because I'm, I'm crying and I'm, I'm nervous because I don't know what I'm going to do if I can't have this procedure today. Right. If I don't get my medication today, I don't know what is possible for me after this day. So Finally, this nurse comes out and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, just in hysterics, crying. Um, and I'm like, oh, I thought nobody was here. I thought somebody forgot about me. So she's like, no, come on back. Um, go back. They give me, everybody's like staying very far away, but nobody's wearing a mask. Like they're all like, oh, don't come closer. Um, I go into the uh, exam room and um, I sat down and then she like went over my chart, did all my, all my stuff. Um, and then I think I waited for probably another 25 minutes before the doctor actually came in and he was like this incredibly kind, very old man, like a million years old. I was like, I, don't, I was like, how are you still practicing medicine? Um, he walked me through kind of all of the things that the counseling folks did. He also, um, did ask me again what medications um, I was taking at the time. And then he basically gave me the first dose of mifepristone and he watched me take it. So I put it in my mouth, I swallowed it. And then he was like, can you open your mouth so I can check to see that you swallowed it? I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so that happened. And then he walked me through the steps of taking the misoprostol, which you take 24 hours um, after you do the, the mifepristone. Um, so at that point, I left. Um, I had health insurance, so I didn't, I only had to pay a $30 copay. My insurance covered my, my abortion. Um, I put my misoprostol in my backpack along with all the paperwork and I left. Um, 
I went home that night and then 24 hours later, I took the misoprostol and the misoprostol is, it's like two pills that you put on the insides of your cheeks and you hold them there for 30 minutes until they dissolve. And then you swallow water um, after that. Um, and then another great thing that they do is that they did give me prescription ibuprofen that they told me like, take this 30 minutes before you take the, the misoprostol. Um, and then they were like, you need to wear like a huge maxi pad after you take the misoprostol. And then that was it. I ordered takeout. I watched a movie. I went mm -hmm. to bed. Um, so then afterwards, um, I started kind of watching the COVID shutdowns happen across the country. And I watched as a number of um, conservative politicians, Greg Abbott in Texas and DeWine in Ohio, um, started using the PPE shortage to shut down abortion clinics. So they were like, oh, there's not enough masks. So we have to shut down the abortion clinic. And they called it a non-essential procedure. Um, and it made me mad. I was pissed. I was like, I don't understand. I, I had only told a handful of people, my sister, my spouse, like a cl one close friend. Um, I didn't really tell anybody. Um, and the more that I watched them do this, the more frustrated I became. Um, so I contacted the communications department at Planned Parenthood and I said, I wanna write an op-ed about why abortion access matters during the pandemic, especially. Um, so I did <laughs> and it got published <laughs> in the paper. Um, it was pretty incredible, um, to see my words written that way. And, you know, something that, um, was really surprising was the level of harassment that I, I received after that. Um, they posted it on Facebook. People threatened to kill me. People found personal photos of me from the internet and posted them. Um, somebody found out where I worked. They emailed me at work. Um, somebody emailed my boss and told my boss that I had written this op-ed um, I, at the time I was working for a nonprofit, uh, a healthcare nonprofit. And so they were like, fuck you. We don't care. You know, oh, sorry. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> um, they, they, they stood by me. Um, they were very, uh, supportive of me. They kind of told me like, if anybody else emails you at work, you tell us we're going to find them, you know, like, um, so that was pretty interesting and incredible, but, um, it, it, people found my personal email. So there was like four days where I had my sister sort of vet my emails and the, they became increasingly more aggressive where people were like, we're going to murder you. We're going to find out where you live. You better watch your back. Um, they became increasingly more threatening. Um, so I did forward all of them to the police department. I kind of called the police. I was like, I don't know what to do about this. And they were like, do do what you have to do. Um, I had to call the paper and ask them to please turn off comments on the article um, and on the Facebook post. Um, but something that was really cool about the op-ed is that a lot of people that I know and care about read it and reached out to me and they were like, we're so proud of you. You are so cool. You're so brave. I had no idea that a lot of the, like, I didn't know their, um, perspective on, on this issue. And it was really incredible and really affirming to me, um, to do that. And I, yeah, that's my abortion story. It's pretty boring. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing that. And, uh, I, uh, just want to say, first of all, that was not a boring story. At all. <laughs> uh, and, and also the, you know, in an ideal future, we'd all be able to get an abortion without telling our story before or after. You wouldn't need to have an acceptable story to get one acceptable. And, and you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be driven to this, you know, you wouldn't feel compelled to share it afterwards because you need to make political and cultural change. You would just be able to get an abortion. And if you wanted to talk about it, it wouldn't be stigmatized. Right. So you could, but that we're not there yet. So it is so important and meaningful when people are willing to share their stories with, with us and not it, even if it's only to your friends and family and not in a public forum, that does make a huge difference. I mean, I have also discovered that whenever I mention to people that I'm writing something about abortion, so many times people have told me their own abortion stories and often, uh, I mean, they haven't told anyone else before. And these are people that, you know, I would have thought were 
or they are already liberal, progressive, whatever, whatever, I would have thought they would have felt safe talking about abortion. Right. But people don't because there isn't a, a really, you know, there isn't a common culture of talking about abortion and we can change that. And I'm really sorry that you had to receive death threats for contributing <laughs> to that effort. It's insane. Um, but I'm really glad that you were able to receive the care uh, that you needed even during a pandemic. So thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, of course. And, you know, I think um, just to sort of talk about like the, the drama I think around my story was really not around the, the abortion itself, but a lot of it was um, uh, around the decision-making, you know, that I was looking for a job and I was like, yeah, it's illegal for them not to hire me because I'm pregnant, but like, they're not going, you know, like it's not, they're not going to mm -hmm. tell me that, but um, you know, and a, a lot of it had to do with money. And I, I often find that abortion stories on, on TV and movies, like really don't talk about money ever. And, mm -hmm. um, and so I would really love to sort of see that. Um, I think <laughs> the, the clinic being closed and be just being like, what am I just like alone in the waiting room? I, I would love to see more just maybe like comedy around abortion mm -hmm. storytelling. Yeah, um, well, even yeah. The, the movie that was on in the waiting room, like, <laughs> you'll probably always remember that as kind of an absurd detail of your experience. But yeah, more comedy is essential, I think. And there's a lot of it in the absurdity of, of what abortion is in America right now, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you, um, and I also want to uh, mention that on TV, I feel like the people who seek abortions are so often uh, single, but in reality, a lot of people who have abortions, I mean, most people who seek abortions are already parenting, but then a lot of people are in partnered relationships and we don't assume that um, because the, the, the common misconception is that only single people have abortions, but it's not true. Oh yeah. Um, one of the emails that so, I got, one, one of the harassing emails that I got were, you seem like a mar you, you're a married woman. So obviously they had like Googled me and like found personal photos of me. Mm -hmm. And they were like, why would an educated married woman have an abortion? Right. I think you're making this up. Make a difference. Yeah. I was like, why would I fabricate this? Like, I was like, who does yeah. this? for attention yeah so, so yeah thank you um so next our next guest is uh dr gretchen Sisson. she's a sociologist with the amazing organization answer at ucsf um the mothership for academic research on abortion and reproductive health uh so take it away gretchen yes don't tell goop mocker that but we'll take the title um, <laughs> the yes. um yeah so hi everyone my name is gretchen sisson um i'm a sociologist at answer which is part of the OBGYN department at uh, the university of california here in san francisco um and i get to have a very cool job of, of studying abortion on television um and really looking in depth at what types of stories we see what types of stories are missing um and you know, I try not to spend a lot of time sort of nitpicking like individual inaccuracies, but looking at kind of the bigger picture of what social myths we see recurring on TV and maybe where there are a lot of opportunities for different types of stories that we haven't seen. So I will say that overall, we have ve seen very little medication abortion on television. Um, I made my list um, during right before this call, there's the 13 total. And of those 13, I would say about five are sort of realistic circumstances or circumstances that most American women will be able to identify with. So not like during an interplanetary planetary space mission or a zombie apocalypse, for example. <laughs> so if you kind of take out those ones, if you want a, a portrayal of something that feels relatable to women and what they might actually expect in getting an abortion, um, there's, there's only five. And again, I think there's a role for an abortion story in every genre of show, um, be it sci-fi or, um, you know, horror, or there, there's, there's always possibilities for stories and they're always going to fit the, the type of show that they're on. Um, so I don't want to discourage anyone from putting an abortion on their zombie apocalypse show, but you know, there's going to be different implications for those types of stories that we're seeing. Um, and I also want to push back on the idea that abortion, medication abortion stories can be really interesting and funny and compelling. We've seen a lot of really good examples of this so far. Um, 
one of my favorite abortion stories on TV, not just medication abortion, but of, of all abortion stories that we've seen um, was on the Australian show, Please Like Me. Um, and I actually really encourage you to watch it. I think you can, you can watch just that individual episode on Amazon. It's called Pancakes with Faces is the name of the episode. Um, and it's about a, a woman goes to the clinic, gets her pills. Um, she's sitting on the couch with her best friend. You know, um, they give a really accurate level of medical detail about what the process is going to be like. She puts the pill under her tongue to, to hold it. Um, and it becomes this really humorous scene where she can't talk because she's holding the pill in her mouth. So he keeps trying to like, you know, provoke her into conversation by saying increasingly inflammatory things to, to try to get a response out of her. And um, it's very funny. Um, and, and then they show, it's the only show to actually show someone with a medication abortion actually expelling the pregnancy. It's not graphic, but they show her in, in the bathroom um, on the toilet, she's kind of moaning and groaning and, and her friend is kind of pacing outside and he goes like, are you okay? And she's like, yeah, I'm okay. Hey, if you don't hear anything, I'm okay. It's when I'm screaming that, you know, I'm not okay. And it kind of acknowledges that like physical reality of passing the pregnancy, um, you know, not being nothing. It's a lot, a lot of cramping, good amount of blood. And it has this moment right before she flushes the toilet where she just sort of like looks, takes a deep breath and flushes. And it's, it's funny. It's well done in a way that isn't flippant, isn't over the top uses the fact that it's a medication abortion, actually find opportunities for humor. Um, and it's just a really great example of how you can make something that seems pretty boring, just taking some pills and turn it into a reflection on their friendship, their relationship, um, her decision, her ability to experience that at home with her friends nearby. Um, we found narratively that um, surgical abortion procedures when they're on TV. Um, I think there is something that it offers to screenwriters to have a character go into a room, have this moment, usually in isolation, usually without a friend or, or family member present, um, and then leave that room no longer pregnant, right? I, I, I see that the storytelling potential there. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of storytelling potential in being able to be at home, being able to be around your support people, um, having it be a longer process. Um, you know, the, there's an episode of the, the show Brockmire where um, the woman and her boyfriend, they, they travel to get the medication abortion and they go back to their hotel room um, and he accidentally takes her pills. Um, and there's like a lot of like humor and mayhem and confusion. Like what is, what is going to be the impact of this on his butt? <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's really ridiculous and, and bizarre. And so there, there's opportunity there. Um, so those are some really good examples, but there are some trends that I, I do want to point out and push back on. And when we're talking about, when I'm talking about trends, again, I'm talking about a pretty small number here, but just some things that I've some sort of traps that storytellers have definitely fallen into that I think it's important to note. Um, one is, is we've seen a couple of episodes, a couple of shows that have used medication abortion um, as a means of coercing someone into an abortion um, by sort of surreptitiously administering uh, medication abortion, grounding it up and putting it in a smoothie or something like that, giving it to them secretly. Um, so someone trying to force someone to have an abortion without their consent. That's portrayed. Um, we also see abortion, medication abortion is really dangerous in a couple episodes. Um, we see this about all abortions uh, generally on TV, but you know, there was a, a character who had a medication abortion and ended up hemorrhaging and needing a hysterectomy. And, you know, of course that's, that, that's not a, a plausible adverse outcome for most women who are having medication abortion. <laughs> Um, we also see the conflation, and this one's important actually. Um, this is this is sort of like a, a detail that I will really drill in on. Uh, I tend again tend not to get too stuck up in like accuracy details, but this one is important. Um, we see the conflation of emergency contraception and medication abortion. So emergency contraception, that's plan B. Um, you have sex that was unprotected or that wasn't protected to the degree that you feel you wanted to have protection. Um, you can go to the pharmacist and either, depending on the state behind the counter or over the counter, um, get plan B, which will prevent a pregnancy. If you are already pregnant and you take plan B, it's not going to do anything. Um, the process of accessing medication abortion is very different. It requires a prescription and a lot of states you have to go into the office and a lot of places you have to get an ultrasound. Um, it's much more highly re regulated form of medication. And of course it will end the pregnancy. So those are different types of drugs. And, and we've seen a couple of shows sort of talk about them interchangeably or say that they're talking about medication abortion, but show a box that says emergency contraception, for example, they're very different drugs. And so it's important to, to be clear on that um, because it, it does make a difference. Um, 
another thing that I think is important for shows to talk about is again, the, the physical reality of having a medication abortion. So for example, um, this is not nothing. <laughs> this is not, this is not the same as really having your period. It's, it's a more intense physical experience this is what we've heard from patients who've had abortions. Um, and so I think that there is a, a tendency to want to show abortion as so safe and so straightforward um, that that for some storytellers, they kind of gloss over what that experience of actually passing the pregnancy, expelling the pregnancy looks like. Um, and the risk of that is that we've seen women who um, have self-managed their abortions through medication abortion um, in a way that is medically safe and physically safe, um, but they're surprised, for example, by how much discomfort they're in or by how much blood is part of that process. And, and then they go to an emergency room and that's where they're putting themselves at, uh, at risk for criminal justice prosecution, right? So um, while medication abortion is safe medically, they're opening themselves up to a different kind of risk if they, if they have false expectations. So I think that shows shouldn't be dwelling in sort of the you know, again, the, the graphic part of that, if you want to, you can, but if it doesn't work for your story, you don't have to. But I think that there, it's important to acknowledge the reality of that in an important way so that people mm -hmm. actually know what to expect from that experience. Um, right. And the reason why I think it's worth getting some of these things right is um, I had the opportunity to work um, with a show uh, looking at on an impact study for a medication abortion plot line. Um, the show had a 45 second scene with a doctor and a patient doctor telling the patient what medication abortion is, what it looks like to expect, you know, you know, saying specifically, some people say it's like a period, it's actually a little bit more, you're gonna be a little uncomfortable, you're gonna take this pill tomorrow, come back in two weeks for follow up to make sure it worked. Um, and we found that in audience surveys, before and after viewing the episode, it actually did significantly increase their knowledge of medication abortion. And this isn't a mm -hmm. huge plot line. This was a subplot line, again, less than a minute long scene, um, but giving some really concise, accurate information so that people know what medication abortion is, know what to expect and have a sense of it can actually impact how people are thinking about this and what they know about it. So that's the big picture of medication abortion okay. on TV. Some, some things that I think are highlights, some things that I think we are worth, you know, being particular about. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Um, before we go to Becky, I just, could you, I'm going to post um, a link to your, the 2020 report of abortion on screen in the chat for the audience. I would encourage anyone who's interested to, to look at the research. It's really fascinating and fun to see how abortion has been represented on TV and film. But if you could just um, tell us maybe the top three misrepresentations of abortion generally, medication and uh, in clinic procedures on television. So television versus real life from your research. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the three biggest things, the three biggest missteps that we see as far as inaccuracies or social myths are, are the idea that abortion is more dangerous than it actually is. Um, the complication rate is much higher and the severity of complications that we see um, is, is much greater. Um, so my go-to joke, which if people have heard me speak before, they probably heard it because I always say it, is um, if you have to get an abortion, don't do it on television um, because it's <laughs> much, much more dangerous. Um, so I think that's important. The other piece is that abortion is pretty easy to access on television. Um, you don't see a lot of issues of figuring out cost, calling an abortion fund. I know, you know, Merritt worked at the T fund in Texas. She's really familiar with the logistical work that it takes to access an abortion in a lot of parts of this country, you know, getting a ride there, um, paying for it, getting childcare for the kids you already have, taking the day off work. Um, we see very little of that work that goes into getting an abortion. So those are probably the two biggest things is, is the function of safety and the lack of portrayal of barriers. Um, okay. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so now I'm going to uh, bring in uh, eminent TV writer, Becky Hartman Edwards, Emmy nominee, Peabody Award winner, um, for many shows you've all seen, including Sex in the City, Living Color, and um, most recently, The Bold Type. And um, The Bold Type did an abortion story, which Becky, I'd love for you to just summarize that storyline for us and then talk a little bit about why you think Freeform was um, 
was good with it, why they accepted it, and uh, and the process of creating that abortion story. Sure. Um, for those of you who don't know the show, uh, it's about these three women who work at a magazine that's sort of a more feminist version of Cosmo, although Cosmo would say they're a feminist version. Um, and we wanted to explore, it was right around the time of the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Um, so sort of we were in our writer's room, the topic of abortion came up and it was shocking how many people had abortions or had and none of us had ever talked, like in writer's rooms you talk about so many things that none of us had. And we were realizing that um, there was really no culture of normalizing abortion. And we were also at the same time as we were having our sort of personal conversations about that, trying to break a story for Kat, our most outspoken character, who was gonna be running for office and they were doing like a like an oppo research thing and we had decided we were looking like what's the thing in her past that could be interesting that we don't know about her and we landed on the fact that on the message board it said something about an abortion that she had in college and as they're doing the oppo research that had come up and something that she had to weigh as she was deciding whether she was going to run but what we wanted to do is really explore why with her two close friends it's like the charm of the show is that these three women share everything and that this was something that had never come up. And so they were almost kind of, we wanted to explore what one of the things I think it was uh, Dr. McNicholas was saying, like just normalizing it and why don't women feel comfortable like, talking, didn't mean she had to, but just that it had never come up. Um, and so it worked beautifully for the story that we wanted to tell and it helped do like it was great because it got to do something that we all felt needed to be done which is have those kind of conversations and then building on one of the um experiences that one of the women in our room had had we wanted one of the women that she was talking to about it to discuss an experience of having going to one of those fake abortion clinics and how they give you misinformation and terrify you and that felt like a really um again, it worked well in the storytelling. We weren't trying to get preachy because we wanted to have her and this woman start to grow closer and relate on something. And also I felt really happy and proud that I was able to do something. I didn't even know about these fake abortion clinics until this woman had shared that story with me. And it felt like it was a great way to get really important information in a show that's really about um, female friendship and feminism and do it in a way that was digestible, entertaining, and would hopefully make an impression if there was somebody out there who was pregnant and would, you know, would keep them from accidentally stumbling into one of those clinics. So we didn't do a medical abortion at all. It was much more about somebody who made a decision because she got pregnant in college, clearly knew it wasn't gonna be the right thing. There was not a lot of angst or drama around the decision. And it wasn't like she was haunted by it in any way. It was just that we live in a world where people who have had abortions, there's not really a way when you're sort of talking about various experiences that that's one that you feel comfortable bringing up. And so we wanted to explore that a bit. Um, so that was sort of the, how that episode came to pass. Um, and Freeform with the bold type, with this topic and honestly with other topics as well, we like to say we were a little bit on the fourth, I mean, white privilege and dealing with class and cult and race have been around for a very long time, but we sort of tackled it head on with the friendship and they pushed us to go even further when we did that topic. And then when we did abortion, it was the same thing. I was sort of expecting because I'm older and have come up through the, you know, the started breaking into writing in 1990 um, and, and grew up in that, started writing in that culture where, as you said, the sort of like averted abortion, where it was just, Anytime we'd raise the idea of like, you're looking for stories for your female characters, maybe they get pregnant and have an abortion or whatever. It was always, it was just seemed to be an accepted thing that that of course couldn't really happen. Like you would have them talk about it, but you wouldn't actually do that. So it now, you know, cut to 2019, whatever it was in on the ball type. Freeform was really, I, care, I credit Carrie Burke a lot for championing the show and championing that kind of culture at Freeform. And um, I was amazed at how little we got, no, I mean, we did call them to, before we dove into breaking the story to say, hey, we're thinking of doing this. We wanna make sure. And they were like, great, go for it. Don't hold back. Um, so that was very refreshing. Wow, cool. Let's hope that's a sign of <laughs> changing times. Um, I mean, I think uh, another paradox uh, in television and, and movie making is that the gatekeepers, the executives, um, I mean, are, you know, mostly still men, I think that that has something to do with it, but that also most people know what they know about abortion from film and TV and the way it's represented in the media and the way that pervades the kind of general consciousness and it's misrepresented there. Uh, 
so we don't have a broad diversity of accurate stories. And so if you if you pitch an accurate story about abortion to uh, a TV executive, it's, it may sound off because it's not the it's not what people believe to be true about abortion. So we need to tell more stories in order to to shift that, I think. Um, and that's what we seem to be in the middle of. I mean, um, Gretchen's research has shown that more and more abortion stories are being told. And uh, and I think that any time you have a chance to, as I think Dr. Manicola said this earlier, to to make abortion to make an abortion story a smaller part of a character's story, that really normalizes it. Well, um, what made what was great about this storyline was the 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 A story was is Kat going to run or not? And it wasn't even just because of the abortion, but it meant that she was going to affect her work at Scarlet. Like this was just one of the mm -hmm. very of the factors. And it became an interesting thing that she hadn't mentioned to her friends. That was not like the A story wasn't like, oh my God, this thing came out that Kat had an abortion and why didn't she tell her friends in their big fight? It was mm -hmm. really part of a much bigger story. And the woman who ended up becoming your campaign manager was the woman who had had the experience in the fake clinic. And it was really about her journey towards deciding to run and deciding to hire that woman. And that was amongst many other stories because we always have at least three stories going. So it was sort of, you were writing about abortion and kind of normalizing it in the same way you would with an important detail in one of your stories, but not the central focus of it. Right, and I, I think that is super realistic. I think that for most people who seek an abortion, it, it lands in the middle of all kinds of other things that are going on in their life. It, it's, right. uh, and you, you have to consider it within all of that to, to do an accurate portrayal. So um, I think uh, now we'll take some questions from the audience. Um, uh, so this one, uh, Dr. Manicolas, um, someone's asking what the primary role for the clinician in a medication abortion is beyond simply prescribing the drugs, and how does that doctor-patient relationship differ from an aspiration abortion? That's a great question, and uh, the answer is it sort of depends a little bit on the state. So um, I think the point that you are trying to highlight is that the process of medication abortion is so simple that really you don't necessarily need a physician to do it. Um, and that, that's true, and we know that from the research. Um, for example, though, in Missouri, um, it is an a intervention that requires a physician. So Missouri has a law that says nurse practitioners, for example, or PAs or nurse midwives are prevented from providing abortion care. It's another example of sort of the ways that states can restrict abortion. But quite simply, I think you, you stated it, which is that um, the, the required interaction between a patient and a physician is pretty minimal. Um, there is certainly the, the standard or traditional um, conversation with patients about their medical history and their appropriateness for the intervention. Um, but the technical component is quite simple and doesn't require a physician, except for to follow the law. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a question maybe for uh, Gretchen and Becky or, or anyone who has an opinion, but um, do you feel the drama surrounding the decision to get an abortion fuels the anti-choicers to make it more of a moral and emotional decision versus if media showed the drama as related to obtaining the abortion, would that take the emotion out of it and normalize it? And maybe Gretchen, I don't know if your impact study reveals anything about that, um, but what do you think? Um, I will say that, um... So, and we've talked a little bit about this sort of like averted abortion phase that we saw a lot in the eighties and nineties and then sort of toward like the nineties and, and through the early two thousands, um, we saw a lot of stories that were really abortion stories that were about the decision-making process and sort of the getting the abortion or the deciding against the abortion was kind of the end of that story arc. Um, Recently, in the past five to 10 years, we've seen a shift where that's no longer quite the case, where like the decision is actually a relatively small part of the abortion story. Um, the getting the abortion might be a bigger part of the story. And then like what that actually means for that woman and her relationships, her friendships, her marriage, her other children, her career, her education. Um, and I think that that's actually a much more 
meaningful way of thinking about abortion stories. Um, because, you know, most, for most women getting an abortion is one, maybe two day procedure, um, and, you know, a temporarily small thing in her life. Um, but how that creates impact for her, um, will really reflect why she made the decision that she did. So, we're actually seeing less of that sort of like hand wringing, fraught decision making process than we were maybe 15, 20 years ago. And I think that that's progress because it shows how women are actually experiencing abortion in their lives. Um, you know, it's, and this is also, I think, um, where past abortion disclosures like the one that they had in the bold type are really important because it's actually not super common that you are going to know a friend of yours as she's getting the abortion and need to accompany her to the clinic. Like she's probably only going to take one or two people and she's probably going to do that maybe one or two times in her life. Right. But the number of people that are around you who have had abortions and sort of what that means for the life that they're living right now, um, that's a much bigger part of our world than people acknowledge. So I think that that's important. Whether there's sort of like more of this anti-abortion knowledge in this like prolonged decision-making process, I think that, that there might be something to that actually, um, because we know that women have real, a really high degree of certainty when they show up to that abortion clinic. They have really low um, reports of regret after their abortion through three to five years afterward and beyond actually. So, um, these stories that make it a very, very hard decision or a very, very long decision do not reflect what we know about women's experiences. Um, so I think that that is, I think that that's a myth about abortion that is pretty common in our society that this is a very, because it's a big decision that it's a hard decision. Um, and so I think that that shift in storytelling that we've seen um, has been an important one. I, I'll okay. just thank you. jump in. I think this will be shorter. I, I know for us, when we were in the bold type room, again, it wasn't even really, we already had a different NA story. We were just looking to sort of add it and this felt like the right thing. But I think also because of those stories in the eighties and nineties, I mean, this is less of a moral and whether it's good or bad, just a lot of those stories have been done. So you, if, part of it was just out of a desire to tell a, look at abortion and tell a different abortion story rather than the hand wringing one, because as you said, in the eighties and nineties, when they always had conveniently timed miscarriages, we would, we went through a lot of those journeys, you know, versus what seemed to be the stories we hadn't seen. And frankly, the stories we knew better, which was, as I said, mm -hmm. people you know, in your life who've had them um, and other aspects of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so, uh, here's a question about um, someone's asking, say, if you encountered protesters at the clinic. And I think this is another, uh, it, if you're telling stories about abortion, the, um, the anti-choice side is so, there's so much, there's so much story there in um, the protesters and the, the protester who inevitably has an abortion. Uh, in all of the trap laws that are constantly being um, pushed uh, in various state legislatures. And then, I mean, in Texas, the most recent one that is so unbelievable is this movement for cities to declare themselves sanctuary cities for the unborn. Some municipalities have been passing places where there isn't even an abortion provider have been outlawing abortion. Um, so there's a lot of uh, story on the other side, um, I think, uh, worth telling. But say, uh, did you encounter any opposition at the clinic? Um, on the day of my appointment, I did not. Um, I should have added that um, you do have to, I think six weeks later, you do have to go in for an ultrasound to make sure that um, the medication abortion took. Um, and so that was the day that I did encounter protesters. But um, again, like, all men, all white, like clustered around, no masks on in front of the clinic. This is in April. So like, you know, now that you have to wear masks and they're just blocking the sidewalk. So I kind of like went, I was like, oh, hell no. And so like I walked around and <laughs> I kind of diverted myself. Um, so they didn't actually see me go into the clinic because they were like very busy, just like jabbering to themselves. Um, but then when I came out, they were like, miss, do you need help? Do you need help? And I just was like, leave me, leave me alone. Um, so yeah, there wasn't like, I don't think anybody was super aggressive, but, um, they were there just like clustered together, mm -hmm. spreading their germs. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
Dr. Nicholas, this is a question about uh, being a provider. What are some of the interesting stories about abortion providers coming to their work? Um, so I guess feel free to answer for yourself or just for, uh, I'm sure you know other providers and how they've come to the work and what it's like, how you end up being an abortion provider. Um, we'd love to know. Well, yeah, I think everybody's um, story to how they get to, to this work is different. Um, but there are certainly some themes that are similar. Um, I think, you know, the abortion providers that I know, and we are a small community, so we know a lot of each other, um, are really empathetic and compassionate folks who sort of see, particularly those who provide care in really challenging places um, and places where it's restricted, um, see the, the real inequity and in, in how um, people and our patients are treated when they're just sort of looking for some basic medical care. So uh, I think that's a consistent theme. You know, for me, I will say that um, I grew up in, on the South side of Chicago in a fairly progressive, although I didn't know it at the time, family, um, and then went to medical school in Missouri and had a really eye-opening experience to what most of the country, at least the, the South and the, in the middle is like. Um, and so it was really through sort of the learning about um, disparities in healthcare broadly, and then specifically in my chosen field of OBGYN, um, that really sort of drove me initially to want to include abortion in part of the sort of totality of the care that I provided. I will say I didn't, um, I didn't forecast that I would be this person today, um, but um, it was then through sort of through Heated realization um, and interaction with, for example, the Missouri legislature that I just found the sort of the tactics and the strategy of dismissing science and really invalidating patients' experience and need for abortion that pushed me more and more to be um, really, you know, at the forefront of abortion care. Cool. Thank you. Um, so here's a question. I, I think maybe uh, Gretchen or Colleen, you'll be able to talk about, is it, someone's asking about money, the price of a medication abortion without insurance. Um, it says, I know many younger people who get abortion are under their parents' insurance, so they usually wanna pay out of pocket in order to protect their privacy, or are there programs to help pay for them? Um, and I'll just mention that uh, there's, uh, there's um you're not guaranteed abortion coverage with health insurance. And so, and some policies actually require you to purchase additional coverage for abortion, which doesn't make any sense because no one plans to get pregnant in order to have an abortion. So it's not coverage that you would logically mm -hmm. buy, I think. Uh, um, and then uh, also some providers don't take insurance. So it, um, but this is an interesting fact that over time, considering how the American healthcare system works, the cost of an abortion out of pocket is a really astounding model of keeping the cost low. Um, uh, but then if, if either of you could talk about the specific cost of medication abortion without insurance. Yeah, I, I will say that again, sort of highlighting the different realities for the patients that I see in Missouri versus in Illinois. Illinois is a state where both public and private insurance are mandated to cover abortion care. And Missouri is a state where both public and private insurance are forbidden from <laughs> providing coverage for. So, um, so every patient I see from Missouri is figuring out a way to pay for, their, to, to pay for the cost of their care. I, I think you raised one of the most important points, at least from the sort of perspective of um, the clinic and, and sort of the, the service delivery, which is that the cost of abortion hasn't changed over decades. And that's really a reflection of we as providers understanding that the cost burden falls really on patients and doing everything we can um, to be able to, to keep that cost down. There are lots of wonderful organizations through the National Network of Abortion Funds where um, each individual state, not every state has one, but lots of states have specific abortion funds that help cover the cost of not just the procedure in some cases, but also the cost of travel or your child care during that time. So there are definitely um, a pretty intricate and um, amazing network of organizations that are helping folks pay for that in the event that their insurance doesn't cover it. And can you tell us just for 
curiosity, do you know off the top of your head what the cost of a medication abortion is in your clinic? Yeah, for every clinic it ranges. So for us, it's about $350. And, and okay. we approached a, a medication abortion um, as sort of a, a total picture. So if they require something else after or in addition um, to help finish that care, it's all covered in the cost of that uh, procedure. Okay, thank you. I will just add that um, folks are often surprised that medication abortion isn't, uh, is not often less expensive than other abortion options. Mm. And some clinics intentionally try to price them similarly so that women are not making a decision about the type of care that they want based on cost. Um, and also if you're, if you're looking for like numbers, I will say like I worked on the abortion fund, both here in San Francisco and in Boston, those prices in, in, in bigger cities are higher than what Dr. McNicholas mentioned. Um, we were looking around, um, about 560 for a, uh, in clinic procedure and just a little bit less around 500 for a medication abortion procedure. Um, so, you know, again, I work, I volunteered at these funds about 10 years ago, so it's probably a little bit more, but definitely, um, for clinics in bigger cities, the price will be a, a bit more. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think that is, uh, it, it is also relatively low for an out-of-pocket in-clinic procedure in our healthcare system. And I think it's important to point out that that's one more way that, so the, the anti-choice like side likes to push the idea that people who run clinics are in it for the money. That is one thing that has been uh, uh, <laughs> alleged and it's so false that you really, do not go into abortion provision for any reason other than you want to provide health care, I think. Um, so here's a question for um, Faye, if you're comfortable answering, or um, Dr. McNicholas, just to talk about what the physical reaction after taking the second pill um, or the pain is like and how maybe how it varies from person to person. Um. I'm happy to go and if Dr. McNicholas, if you have something to add, I, I'm sure you do. Um, I had great painkillers. They gave me prescription level ibuprofen. Um, I took it 30 minutes before and I sort of relied on it throughout. Um, there was definitely quite a bit of discomfort, I would say probably starting an hour after I took the second dose. Um, and that I think continued for maybe another three days. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, it, it just, it really, for me, it just felt like extremely heavy, intense period cramps. Um, I know that that is not the case for everybody, but in my experience, it was like that. Um, the other thing that I think, um, I, I didn't talk about is that, uh, after the medication abortion, they do tell you that you will bleed for about four to six weeks. So that, that is something that did happen to me and, um, that I did not like very much. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for sharing, Faye. Um, yeah, I will say that everybody's experience is different. And so our approach is to try and sort of, um, get some understanding of what their prior experiences, either with their current periods, do you already have heavy and crampy periods? Do you know what that's like? Or um, what is your current, have you had a miscarriage? Um, you know, we provide medication abortion basically from the time that your pregnancy test is positive through 11 weeks. And so, you know, if you're four weeks pregnant versus 11 weeks pregnant, you're going to have a different experience as well. So um, we try and contextualize it for everybody. But yes, I think in, um, in general, it's a, it's a folks report that it's a heavier than normal period and a more crampy or more painful um, experience too. Okay, thank you. Um, as we wrap up, I just wanna recommend a few resources for writers that I think are really great um, places to learn more about abortion or read abortion stories. And maybe Gretchen, could you talk a little bit about the Turnaway Study just to tell people what it is because I, it's the there's a book called the turnaway study and uh it's really fabulous for telling you exactly what the reality of abortion is and there are really great anecdotes in that book as well yes so um you know, as we mentioned at the beginning of the call, I'm, I'm part of a research group called ANSWER. It stands for, it's a terrible acronym. It stands for Advancing New Standards in Reproductive Health here at UCSF. And um, one of the big 
projects of our whole research group um, was a, a study called the Turnaway Study. And it effectively looked at um, what happens to women who show up for their abortion appointment um, and, and are unable to get their abortion. They want to get that abortion. They're there, they're ready to go. Um, and they're turned away, um, usually because of just, well, in the study, almost entirely because of gestational age. So maybe they're just a day or two past the legal limit for either that state or some clinics will stop performing abortions even earlier than is required by law, um, because the procedure changes. And, and so maybe they're just past the limit for that clinic. Um, so when we say turned away for gestational age, some of these women were still pretty early in their pregnancy. Um, it's not like these were all women who were seeking abortions in the second trimester, for example, though some of them were. Um, and uh, the turn away study follows these women who were turned away from their abortions for five years of their life, um, interviews them a week later, two weeks later, and then every six months for five years. Um, and compares their experiences with the experiences of women who were what we call near limits. So just under the gestational limit for the clinic or the state where they were seeking care. So these are women who showed up, maybe they were just one week earlier in their pregnancy than this woman who got turned away and they were able to access their abortion. So for five years, um, the study compared their physical health outcomes, their um, Mental, uh, mental health outcomes, their psychological outcomes, um, their interpersonal relationships, um, whether or not they were more likely to stay in the relationship um, that led to the pregnancy if they were in one at the time, um, their relationship with their other children they were already parenting for women who gave birth because they were denied the abortion, their relationship with um, that child we call the index pregnancy. And because it was a five-year study, a lot of them got pregnant again. What were their relationships with the, with the children that they had later after being turned away or being able to access their wanted abortion. Um, my colleague, Diana um, Foster has written a book. There's, I mean, there's dozens and dozens of academic papers, but I, I think the book does a really good job of distilling what abortion care looks like in this country and what abortion means for the lives of, of people who need it. Um, and it includes a lot of, um, you know, a lot of research findings, but then every other chapter has, uh, an actual first person story of one of the women that was involved in the study. So it's, I mean, I mean I'm proud of it because I played a very, very, very small role in this study, um, but I'm really proud of, of Diana and the, the body of work that she has has led um, me and all my colleagues on. And, and so um, I, thank you for mentioning it, Merritt, because I think that it's a really good. Yeah, <laughs> it is amazing. And, and also I'll just mention, uh, there's an audio book version that I also listen to and uh, they used some actors that TV writers, you'll probably recognize some of the actors' voices. They used actors to um, do the first person chapters, and it, uh, it was pretty cool. So, uh, And then I'll also recommend uh, a brand new book by Dr. Mira Shaw, who's a provider. It's called You're the Only One I've Told. And it's a really great collection of, of anecdotes of, of real patients um, that she's seen. Uh, and then um, there's a podcast that came out um, this past year that I've that's called Access, a podcast about abortion. And it's really a great introduction. It's kind of a primer for some of the basic issues um, facing anyone who wants an abortion or anyone who's in the world of abortion. Um, so uh, it, it, it's really great and well done. So, um, and yeah, uh, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, Kate, should I turn it back over to you? I just want to say one thing, Merrick, thank you so much for leading us through this. It was amazing, your knowledge and the writing that you've done. I mean, I feel like <laughs> I'm so grateful I'm like an audience member, not a panel. Like, thank you. I just wanted to just say. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you. I love abortion. I think it's just, uh, it, it's such a fascinating convergence of death and sex and politics and religion. And it's all in there that, especially for a storyteller, it's an endless well of yeah. Uh, of great thought. So thank you. I'm really thrilled to have been able to do this. Yes, and thanks. Uh, yes, I, I have to say I, I'm going to take credit for having a brainstorm and, and asking Merritt to moderate. <laughs> you thank you. Way better moderator than I would have been. <laughs> so um, thank you, Merritt. Thank you to all of our panelists and, um, and to the audience. Before you go, 
we will be putting up a survey uh, for the audience to respond to. Let us know what you thought of this panel, what other topics you're interested in, if you intend to write about this topic, and if we can help you more. Um, remember also that you know Hollywood Health and Society is here to help. We can connect you with some of these experts that you've met today um, or others. Um, to help you develop your storylines and get them as accurate as possible. So uh, you can just visit us at hollywoodhealthandsociety.org and uh, you can reach us through the website as well. But uh, thank you to Faye, to Dr. McNicholas, to Becky Hartman Edwards, to Gretchen Sisson and to Merritt Tierce for a fascinating uh, discussion. And uh, good night, everyone. Thank you, good night.